All right, back to Psalm 30. Now the title says that this is a psalm and a song at the dedication of David. Whenever David's temple or the house was raised, we're not sure if this was David's cedar house that he built for himself or if it was the temple and he's speaking prophetically here, but they held a dedication. When that house was built, they had a dedication. The raising up of David's house and the dedication was a time of rejoicing. It was a time to sing and praise God. And when we see that, when we hear that, that this was a song at the dedication of the Lord's house being raised, the temple of the Lord being raised, it tells us what the spiritual meaning of this psalm is. The temple, or the house of David, raised up is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ raised up from the dead. It's a picture of Him raised from the dead and His people in Him. Look over at John 2. John 2. Christ was speaking one day to some Pharisees and He said they were asking for a sign. How do we know all these things are going to come to pass? And the Lord said in verse 19, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty-six years was this temple in building and would thou rear it up in three days? But He spake, of the temple of His body. Where, when therefore He was risen from the dead, His disciples remembered that He had said this unto them, and they believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Look over to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. So when we read this as a dedication of the raising of the house of David, we look to Christ. We look to Christ. And look at Hebrews 8 and verse 1. Now of the things which we've spoken, this is the sum. This is what the Hebrew book of Hebrews is all about. This is what it's been declaring. This is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Look at Acts 15. Whenever, whenever the uh, Peter had healed the, or had been sent to the Gentiles, you remember, and the Lord poured out the Holy Spirit on them. And uh, some men came down and were saying that, uh, that they needed to put the yoke of the law on these folks. And Peter stood up and said, no. He said, God sent me to them, and He said, and we believe we'll be saved, us Jews will be saved just like those Gentiles, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And after Paul and Barnabas spoke, then James spoke, and here's what he said in Acts 15, 13. After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, he's talking about Apostle Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for His name, and to this agree the words of the prophet, as it is written. And he's quoting from Amos 9, 11, and 12. God had prophesied, saying, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, now watch this, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. When the Scriptures tell us about how in these last days men will all come to the house of the Lord, they'll come to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the Lord, 
He's saying they'll come to Christ who's seated at God's right hand. Because God has raised that temple. He's raised that temple from the dead. And He's seated at God's right hand. And He said there, And all the Gentiles upon whom My name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world. He said, this is what Christ worked. Christ is that temple that's been raised that men might seek unto Him. And He's worked this that you see here in these Gentiles. We're going to be saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, just like these Gentiles have been. So, when you look here now and you see this is psalm is a dedication when the house of the Lord was raised. That's telling us this is a song of Christ whenever He was raised up from the grave. That's what we have here. Now, in this psalm, there are seven uses of the phrase, Thou hast. Thou hast. Now, in these seven things is what God did for Christ and what He did for His people in Christ. The seven thou hast. First of all is salvation. He says in verse 1, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. When Christ hung on the cross, every foe, that was the foe of his people became his foe. Every enemy that was the enemy of his people became his enemy as he hung there on the cross. The devil and all his self-righteous seed became his foe. The sin of his people was made his foe. The broken law of God became his foe. The wrath and justice of God Himself became His foe. The weakness of human flesh became His foe. There was nothing about human flesh, even when our Christ hung on that cross, that would be able to help Him in any way. Death and the grave became his foe. And the second death, that judgment of being cast out and forsaken, if we ever meet God outside of Christ, that's the second death, Scripture speaks of. That second death became his foe. Christ had no help when he hung on that cross. God removed Himself, forsook Him on that cross, and our substitute hung on that cross with no help. The only thing that was with Him on that cross were all these foes striving against Him. He was separated from God, and yet He never ceased looking to God His Father. And His last words even was, Father, into Thy hand. Commend I my spirit. And then his body was laid in a tomb. We're talking about all the foes, all the enemies of his people became his enemies. But what a mighty conquering substitute we have because he defeated all those foes. Everything he did, he defeated all those foes. Because he paid all that his people owed and he honored God and honored God's law and satisfied justice and saved God's people by laying down his life in their room instead, God is so well pleased with him that as the Father promised, he raised him up from the grave. And when He raised Him up, He set Him on high so that Christ could cry out, Thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. He was lifted up triumphant over all His enemies. And in Him, every single elect child of God was lifted up 
and all our enemies were put down. God did not allow any of our enemies to defeat us because they could not defeat Christ. In Christ we were raised up. The devil and all his self-righteous seed and every wicked spirit. The, our sin. Sin we don't even know about. The broken law of God. God Himself. His justice and His, His wrath. Our sinful flesh, death and the grave, and the second death, all our foes were not allowed to triumph over us. God is pleased with His people in His Son. God's not an enemy to His people in Christ at all. God's lifted me and He's not made my foes to rejoice over me. When will a sinner extol God? You know, we come into this world and we go through life and our chief motive for, left in our sin, our chief motive is to extol ourselves, exalt ourselves, lift ourselves up before men. When will a sinner stop extolling himself and start extolling God? When will he start lifting God up and praising God? When God makes him to see that in Christ, God lifted him up and would not let his enemies reign over him. Defeated all his enemies. That's when a man will stop extolling himself and start extolling God. That's what I want to see happen to somebody who doesn't know the Lord and is not believing on Christ. That's what I want. I want to see God make this known to them. So the first thing that thou hast is thou hast saved me. God has given us salvation in Christ. Now the second thing here is sanctification. Verse 2. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Thou hast healed me. That's what sanctification is. Sanctification is being made whole. Being made whole. What did Christ cry to the Lord? What was His cry to the Lord? Now listen to this plea. This is, you can't do better than this. This is, this is the best plea with God right here. Look at verse 8. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Do you know why that's such a good plea? Because the reason the blood of Christ is profitable to show and declare God's righteousness and to save His people from our sins. The reason His blood is profitable is because Christ was not left in the tomb. Christ came out of that tomb and He's the high priest now who ever liveth to make intercession for His people. And He does that with His blood. That's why His blood's profitable. It's a living Redeemer that praises God, that glorifies God, that brings all glory to God. This is why men want to, the devil and his seed, want to try to make out that Christ died and, and that was it. Because it's a living Redeemer. It's one who died and arose again three days later that is profitable to God and His people. It's Christ who promised to praise God and declare His truth in the great congregation. He said there, who's going to praise thee? Christ is the one who promised to do that. That's why He came. He came to praise God, to extol God, to, to glorify God and in His holiness. He came to do it in His life, in His death, in His resurrection, in His gospel, and in His people. And that's what He does. He's praising His people in the great congregation. And God heard Him because of this plea. He says, Thou hast healed me. God raised Christ healed. You say, well, I didn't know he was sick. If you could have seen him on that cross, and what we know of what he bore on that cross, you can see that's not how he came out of the tomb. He came out of that tomb whole. He came out of that tomb holy. Christ our high priest did not enter into the holiest 
bearing sin. He didn't enter the holiest of holies in God's presence bearing sin. He entered perfectly holy, sanctified, without sin, with His own blood. Look at Hebrews 7.26. Hebrews 7.26. He says, Such a high priest became us. Now when you see that word, such a high priest became us, it's not meaning that He became this kind of high priest. It means this was the high, kind of high priest it was necessary for us to have. It was becoming for us because of our sin and our inability to enter into God's presence to have this kind of high priest. What kind of high priest? Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate for sinners, made higher than the heavens. You know, under the ceremonial law, they brought a lamb. And this lamb, this was picturing Christ. The lamb was brought and... The hands were put on the lamb and all the sins of all Israel, just Israel, the elect, picturing the elect of God, that sin, that, that lamb was made to be that sin. When you read in the Old Testament, it'll say it was a sin offering. When you read in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says Christ was made sin. Most people want to take the Old Testament sin offering and interpret the New Testament made sin as a sin offering. It says, Christ was, he who knew no sin was made sin for us. That first word sin, that second word, the same word sin. He who knew no sin offering was made a sin offering? No. Take that New Testament, the exact picture, I mean the exact image of what it truly is, and that's how you interpret the old. That lamb was made, a, was made sin. Before God, when that sin of the people were put on that lamb, it was made sin. And so, justice demanded it be slain. And that lamb was slain. And then the high priest, another picture of Christ, he went into the holiest of holies. But he didn't go into the holiest of holies with a lamb bearing sin. That lamb that had bore the sin had died. And the sin was paid for. And then the high priest entered into the holiest of holies with the blood of that lamb and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. Well, Christ is that lamb. And He died. He put away the sin of His people. But when He commended His Spirit to God and He entered into the holiest of holies, He didn't enter into the holiest of holies with sin. That was the purpose of Him dying. God is too pure. He cannot have anything to do with sin. He put sin away and He entered with His own blood. Look at Hebrews 9.11. Christ being, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater, more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, by His own blood, He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. That's all the picture did. But watch this. How much more shall the blood of Christ, now watch this word, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He entered in that holiest of holies without spot, having already put away the sin of His people. And just like He entered into that holy place and sprinkled His blood, He enters into the heart through the gospel and the Holy Spirit sprinkles that blood in the heart. And look at what happened. Hebrews 10, 14. He heals us within in sanctification. By one offering, He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's, that's the sanctifying work He did on the cross. Perfected us. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. Now this is what happens within. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. What's the What's the outcome of that sanctifying work? That work He did on the cross and the work He does in the heart of His child. 
Verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Where do you have that boldness? You have it in your new heart. You have it now because there's been a sanctifying work done. It's made you whole to have liberty, to understand you have liberty that now you can approach God in the holiest of holies. You can do it by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. That's a sanctified heart. That's a heart that's healed. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So not only did he justify us by his blood, that was the blood he spilled, but the water that came out of his wounded side is a picture of the sanctifying work whereby he made us holy and perfect. When's a sinner going to know? When is Christ going to be made sanctification unto me? When will that happen? It'll happen whenever Christ is entered in and healed the man in sanctification, in the work of sanctification, and made him whole so that now he can truly hear the gospel and believe the gospel and understand the gospel. And then he'll behold, Christ is my sanctifier and he's my sanctification. He's the one that did the work and he is the one who is my holiness. When the Hebrew writer says, speaks of that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That holiness is Christ. That holiness is Christ. You have to have, this is a work Christ does. So thou hast healed me, you have sanctified me. You've made me whole. Here's the third thing. Resurrection. Resurrection. O Lord, verse, Psalm 30, verse 3. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Now when Christ arose from the dead, He arose to die no more. He arose to die no more. And so did all His people in Him. We just read that song. And I, I was reading the words there where it says no mortal can understand or, or believe. or I forget what it said. No mortal can understand how our sins so black can be white as snow. And I thought, I don't know if that's a good statement. But then it, I thought, well, no mortal can know. Your mortal flesh is not how you know God. It's in the immortal new man that He's put in you that you know Him and understand the gospel. No mortal can. It's in that new man that we understand and believe, the God, believe God because when He arose from the dead, He ended death completely. That was the end of death for Him and for His people. Listen to Romans 6, 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over Him. No more. It did once. It did one time. He gave Himself to death. death he said, death, this is your hour. And He gave Himself to death and it had dominion over Him. But He was dying for His people, to justify His people. And because He satisfied God and put away our sin, there's no more power with death. So now it can't have dominion over Him anymore. For in that He died, He died unto sin once, but in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. You mean that's what happened to me when Christ arose? I, I became dead to death? Death has no more dominion over me? Look at Ephesians 2. He raised me up. Just like He raised up Christ, He brought up my soul from the grave. Ephesians 2.4 God who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Christ, by grace you're saved. And He raised us up together. This is when He raised Christ. That's what He was saying at the end of Ephesians 1. He was saying this is the power God wrought toward us. When He raised Christ from the grave, He raised us with Him. Right then. He raised us up together 
and he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And so all who are resurrected in Christ, when he was resurrected, will be resurrected in the new birth and they'll be resurrected in the last day. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Now is Christ risen from the dead, and He became the first fruits of them that slept, or them that were dead. What's a first fruit? That's the first fruit. When you get that first tomato off the tomato plant every year, that's just the first fruit to, to, to let you know there's coming a whole bunch more behind it. Christ is the first fruit of His people. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Christ all die, I mean in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Everybody He represented died to death when Christ went in that tomb and came out of it. Death has no more dominion over us. And so because He put away sin, we not going to die, believer. Listen to this. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. He satisfied the law and He put away our sin. Death's got no more strength for, the, for those He represented. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody asked you and they said, what's your hope? What, what, or what is your gospel? I'll give you one verse you can give them that sums it all up. It's Colossians 3.3. 3. God has said this to me. You are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. We're not dying. Those of you who have been born of God, born again, born anew, resurrected with Christ, you will never die. You'll never die. Alright, here's the fourth thing. Preservation. Preservation. Psalm 30 verse 3. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. See, Christ honored God and honored the law of God. And so, Holy God, now listen to me carefully, Holy God had to preserve His life. Because Christ honored God and satisfied justice, holy God had to preserve His life and not allow Him to see corruption. He had to. Now, men will say, well, God doesn't have to do anything. Yes, He does. He has to do everything that's in accordance with His holiness. He has to because He's holy. That's why Psalm 16.10 said, Christ says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That doesn't mean Christ went to hell. That, he's talking about the grave. He won't suffer thy holy one, and that's the key, thy holy one, to suffer corruption. God's holiness and His righteousness, His holiness demanded the preservation of the holy and righteous Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this carefully. If you don't get anything else, get this. It is God's own holiness and righteousness that is God's preserving power. When we read that we're kept by the power of God, what is that power? It's more, it's more than just sheer strength. It's His holiness. Because Christ satisfied divine justice, His holiness demands that His people must be preserved in and by Christ. That's why Christ could say, Thou hast kept me. You wouldn't suffer me to see corruption. And you can say that, believer, because of Christ. God's holy. Look here at this fifth thing. It's establishment. Verse 7. Lord, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. God's so pleased with his son that he raised him above all all and seated him at his own right hand. Lord Jesus Christ is immovable. 
He'll never be moved. He's the rock. He'll never be moved. That's what he was saying in Ephesians 1.20. He raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. That, that is an immovable place at God's own right hand. And he put him there above, far above, all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world but in the world to come. And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now, do you know what the purpose of that is? You know why he's giving us that verse? Let me read it to you here real quick. I didn't write it down, but let me read this. Here's why he's telling you that. Look. He's saying, oh, that your understand, the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of His calling, what is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saint. And listen, what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and did all that right there. He's saying He raised Him up showing that His power in establishing Christ immovable is His holiness because Christ satisfied justice. He's raised Him immovably anchored in a, in a rock-solid place that cannot be moved and by that same power He established His people just that immovable. Just that immovable. So we can say what Christ our rock said. He brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. It, it seems difficult for us to say things like that concerning Christ because Christ is God. He's God our Savior. But when He came, He came to be the head of His people, to be the, the man representing all His fellows, the elder brother representing all His people the head of the family. And so he was trusting the Father to do these things the Father promised once he had satisfied justice for his people. And God did it. God set him on a rock. That means he can't be moved. And because he set him on a rock, he set his people on a rock. We can't be moved. Don't fret about it. Don't, don't start worrying and think that I'm going to fall out of God's favor and I'm going to, my salvation is, I'm going to, Perish or after all? No. <laughs> no. If we're Christ, and, and it's not about anything we've done, if we're His and He's all our hope, He's the only one we're trusting in, then you're set on a rock because Christ can't be moved. And nobody, none of His people in Him can be moved. And that's so. He established us. He has established us. Here's the sixth thing. Worship. He's made us to worship. Look at verse 11. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Now you think about this mourning. Now listen to Christ speaking this. Thou hast turned for me my mourning. Christ paid such a tremendous price that there was no other sorrow like His sorrow. He said in Lamentations 1.12, Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? The, the man who just comes in and sits down and hears the gospel and he's just like talking about the stock market to him. And he goes out, Is it nothing to you that are just passing by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of His fierce anger. But now, His mourning is turned into dancing. You know what dancing represents in the Scripture? Praise and joy. Rejoicing. And that praise and joy in God is true worship. Look down at verse 12. He said, He did all this to the end that my glory, that is, the one I'm going to glory in may sing praise to Thee and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I'll give thanks unto Thee forever. See, this is for Him to be praised, for God to be praised. That's true worship. When you're, when you're praising God, singing praises to God, your heart's filled with dancing before God, that's 
over what He's done for you. That's true worship. Listen to this verse from, or you can turn to it if you want, Psalm 27, 6. Now shall mine head be lifted above, up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in His tabernacle sacrifices of joy. You see that? Praise. Sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Why does he call that sacrifices? Because the old way of worshiping God was to offer a sacrifice. But the new everlasting covenant way of worshiping God is to sing and praise the Lord for what he's done. Christ is even the preeminent worshiper of God. <laughs> That's right, he is. He said in Hebrews 2 tells us the Spirit of God tells us to apply all these things about singing in the Psalms to Christ. He said there, Both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified of all of, are all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, and he quotes Psalm 22 and Psalm 40, and this goes for everywhere in the Psalm. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And he's telling us in this Psalm right here, all this was done that God might truly, perfectly be worshipped. He turned all my sorrow into perfect worship of God, praising God. Christ is the preeminent worshiper of God because He's a preeminent praiser of God. But He commands the hearts of His people and He tells us this in verse 7. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His. Give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. That's what we're talking about all in this psalm, His holiness. This is what He commands us in the heart. That's when we'll start singing to the Lord. He says, Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto Him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. Instead of offering real bullocks and real calves, we praise God. That's worship. I'll praise the name of God with a song and will magnify Him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bullock that hath horns and hooves. Hadn't he God done that for us, brethren? You didn't know sorrow until He started teaching you your sin. And then you began to sorrow. You began to mourn. But when He showed you Christ and showed you what He's done for you, showed you His holiness manifest in Christ, He turns your mourning into dancing. And you started worshiping God. <laughs> now here's the last thing. He's given us strength. Verse 11. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Now when God raised Christ, He put off the sackcloth of sin, shame, and sorrow that He was bearing for His people on the cross. He put that off. Now He's girded with gladness. Girded signifies strength. And gladness is strength. Listen to Nehemiah 8.10. Then He said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorrow, sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now think about that statement. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Christ is our strength. He's perfectly girded with perfect joy, with perfect gladness in the Father. Perfect. He, he's the perfection of gladness for His people, really. That's why He's our strength. And He girds us with this gladness of strength. He girds you with gladness in the Father. And that's your strength. What's the opposite of this gladness in God our Father? Enmity. Was there any strength in enmity? No. <laughs> no. But in joy, when you're at peace with God and you have joy in the Father and gladness in the Father, that's your strength. That's your strength. Isaiah 61, 3, he said, he came to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. He says here, he's turned my mourning, he's to put that sackcloth off, and he's girded me with gladness. He came to give unto them beauty 
for ashes. All for joy, uh, all of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, so that you might have strength, so that you might be trees of righteousness. Like those big old cedars in the front of my house that are just anchored. Trees of righteousness. See, he's given you joy. He's given you beauty and the oil of joy and the garment of praise. Praising God, worshiping God now for the first time so that you might have strength with God and be truly planted like a tree of righteousness with God. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. And is that point getting across? I mean, that's, he's girded us. Girded his strength. He's girded us with, he's clothed me with the garments of salvation. Covered me with the robe of righteousness. And so he says in Ephesians 6, 14, Stand therefore. That's what you do when you have strength. Stand therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth. There's our gladness. The truth. We're glad in Christ. And God's glad with us in Christ. And there's our strength. He's given us everlasting strength. Now let me send you home with this one last thing. Let us obey Christ. He says there in verse 4, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. Sing unto the Lord and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. Everything we've been reading about here and everything we've been hearing our Lord Jesus sing about in this psalm has been all about God's holiness. That's his chief attribute. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, he didn't hear the angels. They weren't singing a Beatles song. They weren't singing love, love, love. They were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That's his number one attribute. Everything he does has got to be in accordance with his holiness. So we sing to the Lord. When we see Christ, we believe on Christ, we're singing to the Lord of his holiness. That's where we see His holiness. He wouldn't spare His own Son. And now we know by that same holiness that would not spare Christ, He will not pour out justice a second time. This is His holiness. So we sing and we rejoice in it. You that have been sanctified, made holy. He says, sing. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His. You've been sanctified. You've been made whole by His holiness. When you think about His holiness, thank God for His holiness. And remember this thing too. When you see Christ suffering on the cross, followed by this eternal exaltation, God raising Him up, remember this, verse 5. His anger endureth but a moment. In His favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now it's true, brethren, that our present trials just endure but for a moment. They're just here for a moment. And afterward, they yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Joy comes in the morning. When, he, when the trials worked its purpose, He turns you to Christ and He girds you, He strengthens you with gladness in Christ and His holiness, and there's your strength. And then there's joy. And this is His favor. This is His grace. And His favor is life. His grace is what it, it makes us alive. It makes us live and keeps us living. But better than all of that, brethren, better than any of that, when you see that his anger is but for a moment and weeping is for a night, just remember that's a beautiful illustration of the everlasting day of light and joy that we have because Christ endured the darkness of being forsaken in place of his people. Go to Isaiah 54. You read it before you go there. Read that one more time. Read verse 5. His anger endures but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now we'll go over to Isaiah 54. And let's end with this. I want you to contrast that with this. That, that you know, people read that and they talk about our trials and things. And there's something better being spoken about right there. Look at Isaiah 54, 7. For a small moment, this is what God says to Christ, and this is what God says to His people in Christ. For a small moment have I forsaken thee on the cross, 
but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. You see how you see how they you can compare those two? There's joy, I mean there's sorrow in the night just for a moment. God forsook Christ for three hours on the cross, and then the light came in the morning. And that light that He's given us is everlasting kindness. He'll always have mercy on us. So when you go through a trial and you suffer for a little while and then, then you have joy in the morning, remember, this is just a little bitty glimpse of what Christ endured for me so that I have an everlasting light and joy forevermore. And give when you think of that, sing unto the Lord, praise Him, and thank God that He is holy. <laughs> that He's holy. That's what we love, His holiness. All right, Brother Eric.